Professor Nadic. It's I think unnecessary to make introduction. Everybody knows a long-standing friend of Opava, and uh, so we are happy that you are you visited us again and glad that uh, you are going to give us this uh, short lecture course. So please, Professor Dalic. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Arman. It's, it's always a pleasure to come to Opava. <coughs> Well, for more than a half a dozen years, whenever I came to Europe, I did visit. I would <coughs> and you are all most welcome to visit our institute in Ayuka. Arman has done, and, and he, he, seems, he seems to like it. I, I don't know, but sometimes people are polite, you know. <laughs> <coughs> Okay, so we will begin from the very beginning, no. uh, right from the beginning you have. And uh, my idea here is just to give you a perspective which you will not find generally in any textbook. Or, or you will find very few people who talk like this. But I find it that this is the most direct way to understand things. Okay, so let's begin with the Newton's word. What do, we, what do we know about this? Newton here we were the mechanics. And in particular the uh, give you the how, how the particles uh, move. So Newton's mechanics describes motion of bodies. <clears throat> That's one. And then it gives you the law of gravity. And then you said, okay, in the law of gravity here on the, the force you put in the gravitational force. And so you had your M, this is the gravitational constant, if you want to say. <coughs> so this, so let's, now let's just try to critique this mechanics, the second law of magnetic and the gravity. First thing is the law of the mechan Newtonian mechanics. First, one would expect that mechanics should be universal. That is, it should describe the motion of everything that physically exists. Ask the same question: Does Newton's law that do that? The answer to that is no, because it does not include zero mass particles. So if I want to include the motion of zero mass particles in mechanics, then I need a new mechanics. Newton's mechanics. <coughs> now, of course, you might ask a question, do the zero mass particle exist or not? So we will come to that, yes. They must exist without, like anything else does. So you have a, one problem right here. So the question is, 
the existence of zero mass particles as the Newtonian mechanics is not complete. We need the new mechanics. <coughs> Here in the gravity, what did you do? You will have the these <coughs> things, symbols, and cross them out, and you say the greatest of acceleration is universal. That is, all particles feel the same acceleration. It is a gravity is the most democratic force you have. It does not distinguish between how heavy you are or how small you are or what your shape is. Yes. So it is universal. <laughs> this is universal. But for this universality, so let us try to ask what does this I am on the left represent? How do we define? What is this property? If this is a measure of what? So this is here, so this, this M is the same thing. This M the, the, on the left hand side of the your Newton circuit law, M stands for what? What is this physical nature? What does it physically mean? This is a measure of inertia. That this is the resistance the particle offers if you want to change its state of motion. If you want to accelerate, then the resistance will be proportional to that. So this mass is a measure of inertia. So you could call this an inertial mass. What is this fellow? <coughs> and this is? Amount of matter. Amount of matter is, of course it's, everything is amount. Inertia mass also is amount of matter. Gravitational charge. This is a gravitational, it is a response to gravity. So like as an electric charge, you have m antitelluent to q times the electric field. So this is a response to gravity. So this is the gravitational mass. Of course then you people also do a little further classification of this to say uh, that so in this context here this M is a what you will call a passive gravitational mass whereas this M here is the active gravitational mass what's what we are saying is, by active means that you, the particle which produces the gravitational force, the measure of that. And passive is when the particle responds to gravity. Right? In the Newtonian thing, we have crossed them out and we have Tacitly assumed <coughs> without without acknowledging that these two are different properties. So so what you have didn't really give you to say that you say that MI equal to and G, or maybe a passive gravitational mass, you want to say.
Why should that be? So that's the question we need to look at. That why, why should begin the two properties are totally different? One is resistance to motion. Other is, and that is resistance to motion is irrespective of gravity. May what the force be? Inertia mass will be same which will resist the earth. The other is the response to gravity. And why should these two measures be same, be equal? So that's so if you still want to keep your thing, then you have this a, a very challenging problem to prove or for yourself to understand why the inertial mass is equal to the passive inertial mass. Hmm? <coughs> just to bring it. And this is the same thing which you later on will identify what we call the principle of equivalence. I have a different take on that principle of equivalence. So what we are saying is principle of equivalence demands this. And we keep on doing these experiments to prove that inertial mass equal to the gravitational mass to the order what? Is it 10 to minus 14 or something? And you keep on that. So that's of course, that's the spirit of science that we should keep on always examining uh, the limits. <coughs> and, uh, however, I have a question whether we think, in principle, to me, even if they are experimentally same, they are equal, but uh, this is a very basic open question. Why should they be equal? And we have absolutely no way to understand that. We will try to see this as we go along that this question is meaningless. Why this question is meaningless? Why what I'm saying is <coughs> that the gravity, for gravity, Newton's second law does not hold, apply. So we will argue for the... So on the other hand, we want you to say more clearly. And then if the Newton's second law doesn't apply, this equality is demanded by Newton's second. So there is no question of seeking this. So I, so I have it for motion under gravity is not described by the Newton second law. And we have a new law where why the matter of what you ought to do in this situation, what you have to see is since gravity is universal, meaning it does not distinguish between different particles in respect of what there must be, then this, most, this property is a universal property which should be described by something which is universally true, that is should be described by geometry. It should be a geometric statement. Moment it is a geometric statement, the mass doesn't enter. The particles, parameters don't enter because that's the geometry is the same for all. We have an example. We, we have an, uh, <coughs> we know such an example. And for example, that's what you have, the free particle. What do you have?
what is what is its trajectory here will be any mass all those all mass will have the same trajectory and you say its trajectory is there is all a straight line right straight line is a geometric statement So this property being universal demands that it should be expressed as a, a geometric property. Same thing should be true for there that the gravity is universal. Now here the universality more clearly we would be saying in the case of a gravity. So gravity is universal means it links to all particles. With or m not zero as well as and so that so that so here we have still not introduced anything we are just what is given we are trying to critique that framework and we are saying why do we need a new word than the Newtonian word there is a Serious fundamental problem with the Newtonian world. So, <coughs> so what you have is that the motion of our under gravity should also be something like a straight line. Now you might ask the question. But straight line is straight line. How do I get into this? So then, uh, of course, you could do you do something more. <coughs> well, that probably gives us one, one indication, and that is that when I said this is a straight line. The straight line is described, is defined relative to certain space-time geometry. So when we, the, my usual straight line I'm talking about is, this is the straight line of Euclidean space. Right? So other possibility then could be that now, instead of, now, what we want really, when the force is acting on something, what do we want? The in general, what we call the straight, the particle should not move in the straight line, but should have a curve motion. Can I not get it? Instead of asking the particle to curve, we could ask the other thing. We can make the space curve and let the particles free. And they all will follow that. So we so that's the possibility it gives you that yes, another way of including an universal force could be that you could have a have a state lines related to a curved space. So when, so when, so right here you get an indication is the what should be a new law of gravity. That new law of gravity will demand so even that the space must be curved. Another thing which would you get <coughs> that 
this thing is very critically demanded by this, by that if we are want zero mass particle to feed force. Zero mass particle, Newton's law don't apply, second law doesn't apply, right? Now, we also know, so now what, let us, let's first, you can you take it here. What can we say about the motion of a zero mass particle? How should a zero mass particle be? Or in particular, what would let's ask the question? What should be its velocity? With what velocity should it move? So first let's ask this. Particle has a zero mass, which means no observer should be able to travel with the speed of this particle. Otherwise, the particle won't exist. So, what you say is, so let us call this, its velocity is some, some V naught. So, first thing you want to say that, suppose this velocity is V naught, <coughs> then, first thing this you know, V naught should be universally constant. But the zero mass particle experiences no force. The sec Newton's second law is, is inapplicable to it. If it experiences no force acts on it, its velocity has to be constant. And si since it experiences no force at all, it has to be universal, universally constant. Now, and since it is going to be universally constant, that means zero mass particles should move relative to all of the mass. Irrespective of their motion. So existence of zero mass particles demand that it's it has to move <coughs> relative to all observers. In no, for no observer, it could be at, at rest. Since it has to move relative to all observers, it has to move with a unique constant velocity. Because if you want to say that no, I say according to me, its velocity should be v one. You can run away from me and say that this velocity should be V2. Now, according to one observer, the V1 is the limiting velocity. Nobody should be able to travel to. Well, the other will say V2 will be a... If V1 is not V2, then I will have a problem. That for some observer, this is it, for others no. So this velocity has to be unique, uh, let's say, uh, constant for all. <coughs> so, uh, 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 uh. Of course, most important thing is existence of the little thing, you will say, W So we first say the zero mass particle defies Newton's second law. Newton's second law doesn't take Zero mass particle defies the law of additional velocities. Because for this law, no velocity could be universal. We can do here a little exercise and ask this question. What, how should I modify this law 
such that it gives it keeps a universal velocity constant for all. And let us say call that universal velocity to C. So, so I say I want to modify this law by some factor f which will depend upon u, v, and c. This is the universal velocity I am talking about. The velocity which should remain in the same. <clears throat> so, without going to anything, let us just, in a common sense, try to find out how, what should be, how should we define the act. So what do we want for F to do? F should first is to satisfy either U or V equal to zero, then W must be V or U, which is not saying much. <coughs> that's, that's what you have. Second thing, of course, we will also say that u, v are much less than c. That for 300 years I have been using this law and we have been very happy with that. So the, new, the Newtonian law should be true, the w, which would mean that when this happens, F should turn out to be 1, and same thing should be here. <coughs> and the third is when either u or v equal to c, then w must be c. So, if one of them is this universal velocity, then W must be C, because universal velocity should be the same for all of them. So, if you do this, then you would say, following these things, what you can write? You can write some. <coughs> one thing should be comes with the product so as that the f should become 1, so you will have a u v by c square, f is dimensionless, you have to make this dimension. You can put some constant a1 you want here, and put some a if you like. The rest I don't do, I simply say you satisfy all these three things to I essentially to want W to be C for when U or V equal to C will give you that A1 equal to 1 and A2 equal to minus 1. And giving you the relativistic law of addition of velocity which will give C, C in red. So, I do this kind of simple exercises also to point out the thing that whenever you are seeking something new, want to modify something, before going into the full-fledged thing, try to do these some simple physically intuitive arguments to get the right thing. And no, you will generally, uh, this method will most often work. And then you feel quite safe that yes, it looks fine now, it, let's go to the full-fledged and find that this, what we get. Uh, 
from a physical intuitive argument will be true, uh, true in general. <coughs> so that's, that, that, that's, uh, that's what you have. <coughs> okay. Now, the basic point which I want to make here is uh, I can use this one. All this, of course, makes sense if the zero mass particles exist. If you say zero mass particles do not exist, then however, even zero mass particles do not exist, then also we have a serious problem of how do, how do we justify inertial mass equal to the gravitational mass. So Newton's law of gravity has a problem which in a way does not directly depend upon whether the mass particle exists or not. So right here we have a problem with this. This that you look at. <coughs> so then let us try to uh, make peace with the zero mass particles. Try to understand in a various ways uh, why should there exist a zero mass particle. Apart from what electrodynamics tells us. You see, my point here is here is simple, simple physical argument. Physics logic, which demands that there must exist a universal velocity in nature. Maxwell's electrodynamic mix gives me the object which has that velocity. It identifies that object. In my disagreement, that I don't know what that object is. But what it is makes a prediction that you have. Okay, so since we are still in the mechanics, let us have one other thing. So then how do we define the free state of space and time? And we all know, well, everybody agrees with this, that the this is, is homogeneous and isotropic and time is homogeneous. What it all means that the Lagrangian of the free particles does not depend on x or t. It's free of x, because it's free of t. Right? So then we ask something simple. That since space is homogeneous, I can freely exchange x and y. No questions asked. Nobody will say no, no problem there. But now I say that not only space is homogeneous, time is also homogeneous. Then, what I can do to x and y, I should be able to do the same thing to x and t. Because your motion does not depend neither on x nor on t. So whatever I call x, I can call t, and it is or vice versa. So I can, can do this. But then you jump back on me that you can't do this. 
Their dimensions don't match. One is horses, other is cows. And of course, I, uh, I should be careful here, of course, I'm away from the, uh, my country. Cows are very sensitive to affair there these days. So that's, that's it. <coughs> so I, I would be careful when I go back instead of cows, I should say, goats or something else. <coughs> So I said, hey, true, the misses don't match, but the homogeneity is a, is a general property. That has to be respected. So if your dimensions don't match, make them match. And for that making them match, you require a universal balance. So this is how you <coughs> so that I so this is the homogeneity of space and time, which is purely your Newtonian class 12 things which we have been learning right from hand. So that in itself, so I can, just I can see, all along, this very profound result was lying there. It was not revealed. You need a revelation uh, when we do a, some, uh, your, some, sometimes when you do some imaginative arguments. Uh, then something suddenly reveals. So it, uh, up to this point we have not really asked for anything from outside. All these things are reviewed, we are all using the Newtonian tools. But we are using this tool with a, the critical uh, mind. <coughs> so you have, so this universal velocity is lying here. And the existence of universal velocity is equivalent to saying existence of zero mass particle. Because the particle which I will want to associate with the object which moves with this velocity has a zero mass. And when I'm talking about mass, because there is only one good definition of mass that is the rest mass. Uh, in our attempt to understand relativity, we have made some very inappropriate terminology of relative mass or that's unknown. So this is the only thing you have. So now let's make an astounding statement. And you would say this, that homogeneity of space and time demand or dictate whatever you like better. <clears throat> existence of and your particles or a universally constant universally constant velocity. This all we have done <coughs> without appeal to Maxwell electrodynamics. So as a matter of fact, all this argument could in principle have been done in the Newton's time itself. <coughs> so we have not used any, invoked anything new, it's all there. However, 
we came to realize this first realize this when that Maxwell gave his equations of motion for electromagnetic field. And there also we realize in the separate if there in the equations of motion there is some universal constant which is the dimensional velocity. Now what is that? So that is to say there is a constant velocity sitting there. And that constant velocity of course obviously conflicts your conflicts with your uh, law of additional velocity. So the chronology took the part that the first we had electrodynamics which gave as a universal velocity and then there arose a conflict between the electrodynamics which demands a universal velocity and the mechanics which cannot accommodate any well universal velocity because the law being uh, addition at w equal to u plus v cannot keep any velocity universal and so the picture starts at this so the basic point to come to the new world is we must internalize the existence of zero mass particle or the universal velocity in, in various ways. Let, let's one take one other argument within the Newtonian thing. So the Newton also said or, or what considered that light travels in a straight line. Something moves in a straight line, no force can exist. That means its velocity has to be constant. So there is a constant velocity sitting there. So, so you have a uh, so so this since it's uh, this thing, this velocity should be constant. <coughs> Another, this is, of course, at least you know the Newtonian mechanics, so you want to do Let us try to tell this to, to a man in the street who doesn't know or no care for what the mechanics is. Yet in that simple logical way, we should be able to say. And that is to ask this question, <coughs> Yeah, of course, some of you might have heard that argument earlier you, since you remember it in 44, so I'm repeating that. And that is, so let us try to probe the concept of universality. By universal T, I mean anything which is same for all and 
equally shared by all. Again, a very simple difference. So this is what we call anything which is same for all, equally shared. Same. Now let's ask the question. <coughs> What are such universal things we know about? And most primitive universal thing, of course we know, is space, which is same for all, equally same, except for a small thing that I'm a troller, so I probably occupy a little more space than when we sort out of that. People are round about, they do likewise. So otherwise, and so is time. So space and time are two most primitive universal entities. Now, if they are universal, then they must be on the same footing. Meaning, whatever is true for space and any physical thing is true, must be true for time. Then we know that way. We know this. The distance between two points in space is path dependent. You go from here to the station, if you take a roundabout way to the station, you go through the park, the railway so. So this requires no more just guess, convincing that you, you do this something like this, then you, you will make them. So distance is a path dependent point. Distance between. Now the space and time must be on the same footing. The same must be true for the time. That is, the time interval between the two events must depend upon the path the clock takes from one event to the other. So for example, in the morning you came to attend this lecture, or attend the class in here, you have a one clock at home in your living room. One clock you carry with you. But these days people don't wear the clock they carry in their pockets. <coughs> I do neither. But now in the afternoon you go by Kartati. Now the time interval between your leaving home in the morning and returning in the afternoon, the clock which you carry with you has traversed a different path. Something like this zigzag because it's travel in space where the clock at home hasn't moved. So its track is something like this. So in principle, these two clocks should show you different interval of time between these two events. But you generally say that no, they all seem to be the same. So then there could be two, three different 
possible explanations. One, of course, you can question my principle of universality. That space is different, time is different, there is no business to be. But this all looks so logical. I don't think it is it's very, it will be very, uh, uh, very crazy that something like this cannot work. That's not the case. The other thing may be the clocks are not of good quality. That you can do the way. Third possibility could be that yes, in true, there is an effective difference. But the least count of your clock is larger than the difference you have. So if the difference comes about only on the tenth decimal place of a second, which your clocks don't measure, and hence then it is not visible to you. Okay, if that is the case, then let us try to explore the third possibility and try to see that how to make this visible. So let's do an uh, experiment. So you have uh, two friends A and B. So this is your x direction, this is your this is time direction. So A stays at home. B has been asked to go sit in a rocket and go for a space voyage at a constant speed. So B does something like this. So B, B has been said that you go by some constant speed, whatever you go high, and you go according to, go for one hour according to your goal. After one hour, turn back and come. So when you, it will be another one hour according to your goal. But in the meantime, you have been asked the B is supposed to send light signals back every six minutes. While going out and also while coming back. So he sends light signals every six minutes. Now the question is, at what interval A will receive these signals? Should the interval be same as six minutes or should it be larger or smaller? Now this you should be able to see. tell me, would it be smaller, larger or equal? Depends on the B's direction. Huh? Would the on B's direction, on the B's going further away? Yes. The interval should be larger. Right. So that's the natural speed is going away, it should be larger. But since it's going away with a constant speed, that magnifying factor should be constant. So let us say the magnifying factor is 3 by 2. So here he will receive signals every 9 minutes. The last signal from his outward journey B will receive in 90, 90 minutes. 10 signals, 6 minutes each. Now he turns back and again comes back with the same speed. Now tell me at what interval on the return journey with uh, the signals, at what interval B will receive them? Four minutes. <coughs> Four minutes because that. The symmetry tells you that now the magnifying factor is two thirds, and so it's at four minutes. And again, ten signals. So when that A and B meet together, B says, Look, I went for one hour, so that's a 60 minute. 
came back by the same speed, so another 60 minutes. So according to him, the, this journey took under 20 minutes. What did the A say? A say, no, you took 90 minutes to go out, you took only 40 minutes to come back. It's 130 minutes. Now here very often people ask me, but who is right? I say it's as meaningless a question as this, I don't know. He's saying that in going from one point in space to the other point, you take different paths and your kilometer readings are different. Of course. If you are riding a taxi, you will fight with the taxi guy, you why didn't you take over straight? But otherwise both would ride. What it realizes is, it is to stay as the light of spatial distance. Temporal distance is also path dependent. And that is what we really wanted to say, to bring the space and time are on the same footing. What happens to the space interval, the same thing happens for the time interval. So that would, so, so this is something like, this is your clock sitting at home, this is your journey, and going back, and then the two clocks happen. So first realizing, there is no question of any being wrong or true. What we have to realize is, like space, time is also path dependent. That's that's a, that's the real thing, and that comes at the door. The space thing. This is your daily, everyday experience. So you are happy with this. But you only say, but if that should be same for the time interval, then you get a job. What's what the thing you have? So <coughs> time is a part of it. There is one other funny thing here we could see. And that is to say, here then here is the triangle. What have we learned? Some of the two sides of the triangle is always larger than the third. That's what Euclid told us. But we, here we have reverse. The sum of these two triangles is 120, whereas the third one is 130. The sum of the two triangles. So what it means? that this triangle is not in the Euclidean space. It is a triangle now in the space and time, not in the space. And the space and time do not combine, combine differently. So what you have is, so what you, so when you, you this distance relation you have is dt square minus dx square. So you have this uh, hyperbolic geometry. Where the sum of the two sides is, is less than the third. Okay. <laughs> but uh, my point was I wanted to get to the next point. Uh, th this is just to realize this one. And the next point, what I want was this, that that, yeah, <laughs> space and time are both universal.
that can they be independent? find whether two things are independent or not. We have to find a property which is true for the one but not for the other. Right? But the moment I do that, I break universality. That if you find a property which is true for the one, not for the other, that means, if you could find this, that means the two things are here, not universal. So, I, so let, 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 let's then take your, take for example, in Czech Republic, two symbols which are universally true for all Czechs. So, I, I don't know where you are, so if you feel offended a little bit, I said yes to. In my generation, for us, one table was your, the president said, how long, no, 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 no. Not talking about that, Dubček. This, now, now, if they were universal symbols for sacred people, they can they be independent. There must be a relation connecting them. But what is that? It is the Czech nation that both of them are Czechs. So, similarly, space and time, if both are universal, then they cannot be independent. There must be a relation, and of course that relation must also be universal. And of course we know what is it that connects space and time. In the velocity, distance traveled by in the time, so you have a Velocity times time. And the question is this velocity is universal. This must be. Yeah, can I ask? So <coughs> I can object, that I, I can find a, pro, a property that time has and space doesn't have. Like? I can say that I can travel only forward in time, not backward, but I can travel forward and back in space. So. Doesn't it break universality? <coughs> Nobody. I, I, I can count it. Uh -huh. uh, if you travel backward in time and consistently do that, you will not find anything different from what you found when traveling forward. So it is a time symmetric. So you will always uh, have <coughs> so, so all this my exercise was just to bring home the point that existence of universal velocity is natural and demanded by your usual common sense experience. What I said is, we should now enlarge our common sense uh, storehouse to accommodate this as a, a so-called common sense. So once we have that, now it is this alone, this is the one thing, and that leaves, leads us to the new world.
And that's what Fortin's Einstein was. So my mind, uh, emphasis on you, this is the critical realization. How well you understand this, or how well you be at home with it. Once you have this, the rest of the thing simply follows. It's a, it's a algorithm. There's no much of a principle. So for example, first you will say, since I have a constant velocity with me, so I can no longer talk about space alone and time alone. So space and time are bound together, so we live in the space time. So we move from three space and one time to a four dimensional space time. So that's so it's a uh, we live forward a big jump conceptually that we live on four dimensional space time. More clearly to say in our uh, thing that we ought to treat time coordinate as uh, with as much respect as we treat x, y, z coordinates. So I am a space time. <coughs> now, as I did this exercise, that the velocity of light is uh, <coughs> that uh, you know, uh, and this is this can flow because that is the universal velocity. <coughs> Uh, that binds space and time into space time. Now, of course, it's a trivial exercise. Once you have this, then the new mechanics it gives rise to is special relativity. So it couldn't have been anything else than special relativity. And the reference of 1844 I was making was here. That suppose, because in all this our argument, we never nowhere made an appeal to Maxwell's theory. This is purely logical argument. So in principle, so when I said if I were born in 1844, rather than Einstein was born in 1844, in 1870 he would have been as old as he was in 1905 when he discovered special relativity, 26 years. And this, this very simple exercise, and would have come to the conclusion that there must exist in nature a universal velocity. Of what I don't, he should say, I don't care. But the simple <coughs> uh, physical principles demand the existence of universal velocity. To accommodate universal velocity, I had to modify Newtonian mechanics. And that modified the cubic weight, and it couldn't have anything different from the special relativity. So in fact, special relativity could have been discovered before mix was electrodynamics in say 1870. If that would have been then, it was most it could have been most remarkable. When nobody was asking for it, it's simple pristine logic, you make this profound prediction. Five years later, Maxwell comes along, he synthesizes Coulomb, Ampere, and Faraday, and adds his ingenious 
displacement current which gives rise to a something which travels in vacuum with a constant velocity, electromagnetic wave. So then five years later, it's Maxwell would have said, what Einstein is was, has introduced as universal velocity, that is the universal velocity of light or the electromagnetic field. It was. Yeah. And again, some five or ten years later, Hertz and others would have experimentally discovered that would have been most important. That you do something purely from a Christian thing, <coughs> make some very profound uh, reaction, and that actually comes out true. Because, you see, without Maxwell theory, whatever I am telling you, However appealing it might look, yeah, it's a good, it's good for philosophers, but it's not, it's not for the worldly people. This is not the physical world, you know. But when it, then of course we all know what the story is that the chronology did not take this this route. Will I tell them what more they did for it? So first we had the Maxwell theory, which had a conflict with the Newtonian mechanics, because Newtonian mechanics cannot tolerate anything, any velocity constant. So then the question came, charging started. Okay, how do we how do we modify the mechanics? Of course, sometimes some people must ask, well, there may be something for the Maxwell. But Maxwell, with this electromagnetic wave and its being observation by Hertz and others, it solidified itself. This is an, and in physics you see that experimental verification of anything, nothing is more truer than that. So you cannot, you cannot touch Maxwell's theory. That is true. The only thing then you can do is try to modify Newton. And that follows 300 years gone by, so maybe it should take a liberty to that. So you, you did. Then it took about 20 years. The best of the minds were working on this road and Poincaré. But two fellows, two fellows, they did almost everything on special radio. If the, it is so, then what will happen? How the light like, will go straight? How the time will dilate? Except making a one critical, and that, that was necessary amount of saying velocity of light is constant. And you now wonder, why is what? What was it? that was holding them back. Because if they made this one statement, oh, they would have uh, be the discoverers of one of the fundamental theories of physics. They would be the rightful discoverer of special relativity. That is where the, it, was, it is a sociological thing. Problem with them was that they were the the, the most prominent scientists of the day. And they were scared if this does not come out right, their entire reputation will go down the drain and the people will laugh at it. So they were scared of people laughing at them. But in the process, they missed the due, correct, very deserved credit of discovering special relativity. And this was the time where everything was so now you said in it. Actually, when the physical discoveries are made, first you see a contradiction, then there is a time of incubation of new ideas, new imagination, 
And then it comes about at right time where the atmosphere is so charged and it is a matter of luck. Who happens to take the final step? There are several people in the thing. Any one of them could have done. On the other end here, so if this were not for this, uh, it, special relativity, if there were no Einstein's, it would have been discovered in a year or two of, of uh, 1905. Because it was all there. It is, it is just for somebody to take. On the other hand, the Einstein, contrary to, to uh, Lorenz and Poincaré, he is a young man of 26, just graduated out from the uh, your gymnasium, had no academic job, a job in a patent office. He did his science in his spare time with friends. And comes out, makes one statement, nothing more to do. Velocity of light is constant. And walks away with the credit of discovering one of the most fundamental theories of physics. Thus, now, if Einstein had done only that, and nothing more, then he would have been one amongst the several other great scientists. But what makes Einstein different from everybody else is he has to do something which was had he discovered special relativity in 1870 before Maxwell's. Without it has to be something so remarkable that you make a prediction by simple Christian logic or a physical uh, principle and concept when nobody is asking for it. This is precisely what he did in 1950. Why? So, after special relativity in 1905, those three famous papers in 1905, so that brought Einstein on the physics war. What does he do next? The real action was in developing atomic physics, quantum theory, where there were everyday new experiments are coming, challenging the existing theories, you require a new theory. Quantum theory was being developed brick by brick. There in that, those three papers, he did have one little thing, which was good enough to win him a Nobel Prize. But after the, that, he withdraws from that. Where does he want to spend his time? In, to find the theory of gravity. What's wrong with the gravity? And at that time, except one little... Yeah, you had something? I think he was in practice at that time. Or yes. Uh, wrong, he was in 1912. Oh. Well, but, but this process is from 1905, but no one was So he tried... <clears throat> so, except for a one little discrepancy of this perihelion motion of Mercury, everything else fitted very well for Newton. As a matter of fact, if you wait, had to wait for, look for a serious contradiction uh, from the Newtonian gravity. We have to wait till mid-1960s. Till then, there was a no serious challenge to Newtonian gravity. And that came from the discovery of these quasars. 
the stellar like object throwing out energy 10 to 11 orders of magnitude greater than the star. That was something astounding, cannot fit into that. So if you look at this thing, so in about 1965 or so, you people start doubting that we need a new theory or so. And take the same sort of thing, 15 to 20 years to, of incubation before the theory emerges, that you would have taken. So the general relativity, instead of 1915, should rightfully be more like mid-1970s or 1980. Good 60, 65 years, much ahead of its time. And I, and I, no, just as a joke, mid-1960s was the my generation of people who started doing general relativity. And who knows what happens, but Einstein did not let discussion prop up at all. So, so, so this is exactly, so in 1915, general relativity discovery was on the same footing, had special relativity being discovered in 1870. And so he was, so why I said that had Einstein done this, because here we were only driven by concept and principle. We made no appeal to an experiment. So Einstein came to the reality by driven by a principle or concept rather, rather than a continuous experiment. So he could have very well argued this way. And yes, he could have discovered special with the 1870. Anyway, that didn't happen. So that's that's where. Well, how are we doing with time? Oh, we got half an hour. Oh. It's up to you. Okay, we are one and a half hour already. Uh, no, I'm, I'm fine with it. So another half an hour you can talk. Mm -hmm. What what I'll leave it with you because this is a ours is an informal thing. So whenever you feel like that, now this is enough for the day. We say. We call it today, otherwise we can see. Maybe I can ask some questions. Sure, sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so let's say, take this half an hour for questions, yes. Okay. Um, when we are talking about the, that the mu as a constant has to be, mu as a has to be constant, mm. it was very nice, but I was thinking in my head that uh, this constant can be infinite and all problems can disappear. But then you you introduce this idea with the space-time homogeneity and then the idea is, is trash because you cannot have the C infinity because units <laughs> doesn't this is, so this is nice. Yeah you know. no, this is this is right. But no one one other thing is also true. <coughs> this is the most aberrant thing, most distasteful thing in physics. Okay. We have is any physical quantity which I can measure becomes infinite. Mm. So infinity is a signature signature of breakdown of your theory. Mm. Yeah. So any measurable thing, the things we don't measure, let them be infinite or zero, anything. Mm. You can play with them. But things you measure has to be finite. So that in the Newtonian concept, this was one of the problems we will see is this. That gravity propagated with the infinite speed. Instantaneous propagation. So that, that that's that view can't. But similarly, in your absolute space and absolute time thing. You had an instantaneous propagation of so, so that's true. That here when you come, then the infinity to totally go down. But on the other hand, uh, in general, uh, we we can't 
can't tolerate on a community infinity. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, also I want to ask or maybe say that uh, when you were making the point that um, a massless particle mm -hmm. is moving in a straight line, because uh, massless particles cannot be incorporated with the second law, um, but it can be incorporated with the gravitational law. Yeah, so it, there is some acceleration on the particle. So how can no, we? No. Ah, so the, yeah, that, that, that's the problem. That's the question which we address in the now or not. This is the topic of the next lecture. Hmm? This is the topic of the next lecture. Oh, right. This is all connected. Yeah, but this is something. So, okay, I think maybe I, I tell this so just to make this thing uh, clear what you ask. Because I, and then, uh, uh, let me try to explain it my own way. So, we have a problem here. And the problem is the following that we want, so like mechanics to be universal, we have to come to special relativity. To include the zero mass particles in the framework, from Newtonian mechanics we have to include zero mass. Similarly, we also see that the gravity must be universal. So let us try to universalize gravity. By universalizing gravity, means I must use zero mass particle must also feel gravity. This it cannot do within the Newtonian framework. Because I know if a force acts on a particle, then its motion must change. But zero mass particle, its velocity cannot change. So now here we have a serious contradiction. How to make a zero mass particle whose velocity cannot change feel gravity? So, and I, I say when, whenever we are uh, <coughs> face this kind of a basic problem, First thing you should do is, if possible, as much as possible, try to forget everything which you have learned. You have to, to think afresh, or in today's language, think out of the box. I never know that's how to come out of the stupid box, but anyway. <laughs> uh, uh, so you have a so you are totally, and only thing which you should trust yourself is your robust common sense. So let me try to look at where do I find such a robust common sense, who is not adulterated by any education, any knowledge about the thing. So I said, okay, I have my <coughs> a Persian friend in my village who is uneducated, but everybody has a common sense. So I ask him this question that look, we have a very serious problem in physics that gravity is a universal force and we want everything to feel that. 
But genome, we have also particles whose velocity cannot change. And all what we know is if the particle feels force, then its velocity must change. So we have this contradiction in terms. Can you try to end? So it's nature is beyond then mm, had a little nose and suddenly he wakes up and asks me back a question. <coughs> you know, I don't understand your question. And he said, the zero mass, feeling gravity means what? What do you want zero mass particle to do? You tell me that. I mean, otherwise I don't know the feeling, gravity, what, 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 what. So actually the critical point is, tell me what it should do. Then we should try to see where, what can we look at. So then I said, yeah, this is fine. So I have, say, some massive object here. A zero mass particle is uh, passing uh, past it. Like all other particles, it should recognize the presence of this massive object. Instead of going straight, it should dip down a bit. Trying to, showing in the respect solution, going down. Uh, like all other particles. So that is, so when I say gravity is universal, this is how the all particles should feel gravity. So, so <coughs> he takes it right, and then, uh, again he goes into slumber. And suddenly he wakes up and asks me, Is that all what you want? I said, My friend, if, if you give me an answer to this question, it's my name after Newton, you know. He said, Okay. Let's go to the riverside. Of course, this is the story I make in my, my village doesn't have the facility of a river. Some of sand dunes are okay, but we go to the riverside. And uh, we go to the river, it picks up a branch of a tree, tosses it into the river. And it starts floating. Then say, look, that thing is floating. Yeah, I see it is floating in the middle of the water. As we walk along, suddenly the river bends. So you have something and you the river and you river bends. And this one side also bends. And then said, look, that branch has bent. I said, yeah, that it is floating on the river, with the water, and the river went that way. So Monsieur Siri asked me, how about you got the answer to your question? The dumb as I am, I said, no. Then said, my dear friend, you are no good for doing anything. Better look after my cows. Tell me, where does your zero mass particle float? I said, space. Then say, what's the problem? Why don't you bend the bloody space? So that's when it dawns to you that the only way a zero mass particle can feel gravity is that space must bend. So, grave, so he doesn't have, see, it doesn't have to change the velocity. It simply follow the space geometry, but space geometry, space is now curved rather than being flat. Here, here in a little uh, provocative thing, let me say, the entire literature and books on general relativity have a one profoundly wrong statement. It is as wrong as 
Your books had said the sun goes around the earth. That's what we see. It rises in the east, sets in the west. But we are very careful right in the school. The kids we tell them not to believe what you see. This is because we are sitting on the earth and going around the sun. That's why the sun looks to you good. With the same logic, the phrase being used in all lit relativistic literature is bending of light. Poor light can't bend. <laughs> what bends is space. I measure the bending of space by the means of light because light truthfully follows the space geometry. But then people say, no, but you know. But my question is, if that was the case, why did you bother our kids right in the beginning to say the sun is stationary in the moon? So that's what I see. But anyway, that's it. So maybe that's where we should be. Yeah. Or any other questions?